it's time now uh, for, for our next speaker, um, a man who uh, I just told uh, or thanked him uh, for making my life easier. Um, and then he smiled and said, oh, no, I'm actually trying to make your life harder. <laughs> uh, it's Doug Engel, uh, Engelbart. He uh, is the uh, inventor of the mouse, um, which I very much appreciate because I hated having to use uh, key commands uh, to do um, <laughs> my computing projects. Um, he is also uh, the founder of the Bootstrap uh, Institute, which brings uh, government and indus industry uh, folks together to collaborate on various issues. Um, today, he's going to talk about uh, collective... IQs, um, which is very interesting to me. Uh, one of the one of the things that I'm always looking at at Pacific Research Institute is, you know, how do we solve our collective social and economic problems? Um, and uh, you know, I guess I come to it from a public policy perspective, but I'm really looking forward to seeing uh, what Doug has to say uh, from the tech perspective. So please help me welcome um, Doug Engelhart. Well, thank you. I was sitting here in the, doing all the game business trying to feel like, how could I make a transition between that world and mine? <laughs> and I thought, well, I should stand up and say, I think I'm a failure. Um, then I would, how do I explain my way out of that? So let me just dive right in. <clears throat> that uh, am I? <sighs> oh, should I start over? Yeah, I'll just, okay. Uh, I want to dive right into this because uh, there's many, many years of work and thinking and on a vector that uh, doesn't seem to be a very pre prevalent kind of thing. And uh, the mix of things that were the, the table here at the prior session was you know, very exciting and thinking about it. And I was thinking, well, I, maybe I chose the wrong path. I should have gone into gaming because uh, uh, my kids almost worked up a prize for me one time when they were uh, 10 years old or something that uh, they were going to give me a prize of being the best magic storyteller in the neighborhood. See? <laughs> and um, so then I got into something serious long before that. So let me just dive right in. That um, all this started once when I I moved down to the Bay Area in 1948 and graduated from college at Corvallis, Oregon. And I'd had a couple of years in the Navy at, as an electronic technician and learned a lot about that. And I, uh, so anyway, I came down for a job working at Ames Laboratory. It uh, was pre-NASA pre terms. <laughs> and uh, after a couple of years, I met this gal and uh, fell in love and once one weekend proposed to her and uh, <clears throat> The first thing she said, why am I telling you this? The first thing she said was, uh, how many children do you want? <laughs> <laughs> what a surprise when you get all your courage up to say, will you marry me? And uh, turns out she wanted 10. And uh, she, she, she wouldn't say yes, because I didn't want to quite you know, commit to that. So she was staying with her aunt in the city. And the next morning, she looked at a shameful and says, Boy, my aunt really lit into me about that. So, okay, uh, we'll, we'll settle for something smaller. <laughs> but anyway, I don't know how many of you, most of you have been going through the engaged business. So for the first time, really thinking seriously about raising a family and having a home and all the kind of goals of that sort. So driving to work the next Monday, uh, I probably shouldn't have done it because this is what happened. I was thinking, you know, Suddenly, I better get my mind oriented about my job uh, and kind of shake off all this other excitement and settle down. And uh, all I thought, suddenly saw, was one long hallway, well lit, nice clean floors, well light. Every 20 or 30 foot, there was a doorway on the right that was closed, obviously an office or something, but just totally uneventful, leading on for forever. And uh, it just really hit me that I don't have any goals for my career. You know, country kid growing up in the Depression type, just getting a steady, interesting job was such a big deal. <clears throat> and um, I was 25 years old, imagine that. So I'm very naive. I've never gotten over being naive. So 
So here's what came to my mind soon. <clears throat> so no, I overdid it. Here's what my came to mind, and it stuck. Anyway, let me design a professional goal which will maximize the contribution my career can make to mankind. And I have no idea where it came from, and it really seemed, oh, that's good, but a sign of how naive I was, okay, well, let's pick on that one. So I started really digging into that, spending a lot of my spare time in libraries and such, trying to find out, well, you know, what are the big things one could do? And struggling with that. And after like, actually it was several, three months or something, I'd been through all sorts of things like this, and I just, one Saturday, says, my golly, <clears throat> this is just too much. Uh, you know, the world's so complex. How do you figure out how to work, work it? Every time you, you see a tough problem, the world needs problem, just understanding it's so com complex, just on and on. So finally, finally, what it emerged to me was, look, <clears throat> everything has to be, these big problems have to be dealt with collectively. And mankind's not getting collectively smarter at anything like the rate of complexity accelerating. That's a term I was not quite using it like that, but the issues and challenges and problems are increasing steadily, exponentially. And our ability to get collectively understanding of them is not obviously increasing at that rate. And so it, it just, I'm, I'm quite convinced after these years of thinking about it that if we don't get collectively smarter to understand these things that are happening in the society and all that the impelling acceleration of its changes due to the technology, et cetera, is just, uh, I, I get this image of, <clears throat> of mankind in some great big clumsy vehicle with compartments for each kind of category of a nation or something like that is living. And the whole thing is moving through an environment. And this environment's getting rougher and rougher. And you look at that vehicle with all of its big wheels and stuff lumbering along through this rough, rougher and rougher environment, and it's being impelled faster and faster. And then you look for how is it being steered? Oh, it's a very, very subtle way in which lots of things are affecting the way it's being steered. Oh, well, that's good. Uh, but then how far ahead does it see? Well, the headlights, the visibility downstream is very limited. Well, when we were chugging along at a slow rate, that was one thing. But the acceleration means we just better get better headlights and better visibility ahead, and we sure as hell better find some better way to steer that mechanism. Or it's just obviously un going to crash. And a crash with the way it's going now is, all right. So that's, that's been impelling me all this time. So seriously, how can we go ahead with the idea of getting collectively smarter? So that, that started looking at it. So uh, within a couple of hours, because of the nature of the training I'd had in the Navy, <clears throat> and one book I'd read about computers, and oh, how many computers were there in the world? Well, I don't know, but there were like only three or four in the country at that time. <clears throat> So I'd read the book, tells you they, you know, punch cards go into the machine and uh, it can print or punch cards out, et cetera. Well, one of the things I learned how to take care of, et cetera, in the Navy was radar. And, uh, oh, so I just knew enough and I just finished a degree in electrical engineering. So I knew that, uh, okay, if a, if a computer can punch cards or print on paper, you electronically can drive anything you want on a display screen to show you. And if the so the radar set could respond to the operator instantly. If the computer can read cards and so on like that, it can certainly then respond to a user. So I got this image of sitting there working interactively with uh, other people saying at the same computer complex tied together to similarly, you could collaborate. That's it. So that was within a few hours of this, this sort of picture, this sort of image grew me, and uh, that's just ruled my life from then. My poor fiance was told, oh, I've got all this excitement, I'm going to change and do this. And uh, within some time I got a, admitted to Berkeley because I realized I'd need some graduate research training, not knowing anything what graduate school was like. And Berkeley had a research contract to build a computer and uh, they'd had it for three or four years before I got there and I was there four and a half or five years and it didn't get finished all that time. But anyway, I took the courses in building it. So. This image just stuck with me, and uh, 
a lot of stuff went on. So let me tell you more, though, about the thinking and all that goes into this. Uh, and it's very, very relevant today, and I believe more than ever that if we don't get collectively smarter, we just, we're likely as a, as a race uh, uh, just to get demolished or just really set back to primitive times. So anyway, that's been over 50 years, exactly 53 and a half as a matter of fact. I don't show my age, I could still climb the stairs, but <laughs> apparently. <laughs> anyway, so anyway, that's the community's collective IQ issue like this. So the thing is, how do they get the best understanding, the most thorough understanding of the situation? So how could they unearth the best candidate solutions and get to realize them? How could they assess the resources and the operational capabilities to select appropriate solution commitments? How do we understand best how to organize and execute these approaches that we select? And then, how do we monitor progress and adapt effectively to unforeseen complications that are unbound to ask like that? So all of these things are really f important. So more unfolded about the way of thinking about this. So I get this image about saying, oh, here's a, um, this <clears throat> whole bunch of parties involved collectively in some big issue, dealing with the external environment or something. So they're interacting with the environment and ingesting information about it, scanning it, etc. And they have to develop, they record the dialogue between them and they collect the intelligence from the outside world and they develop some kind of knowledge product that's the understanding they have. So this process over here of concurrently developing, integrating, and applying knowledge is I just said, well, that's the kind of capability you have to do. And I just used the acronym to Kodiak Capability. So it's like saying, oh, if we went around and did a, a survey of the world now, it's saying, well, what's our Kodiak capability? It's kind of, it probably had not have improved an awful lot in, in basic sense, even though the tools are there. But there's more to think about this. So I said, okay, the collective IQ down there in that collective body of organisms. And call this the thing a dynamic knowledge repository as a way that collecting and integrating you know, the information and say, okay, it's, this is a term then DKR, dynamic knowledge repository, that's just become central. And the challenge of saying, hey, how, how do we collectively start getting better and better at building that so it's more and more effective and gives better understanding, et cetera, but also that uh, is dynamic, that uh, new data, new observations, Somebody comes up and contests some essential part of it. How do you diagrammatically sort of work into the logic of that, in which there's a whole bunch of neat, you know, graphical, graphical argumentation, sort of structuring stuff that's emergent that's very important. <clears throat> so, okay, then it, capabilities become the key central consideration. So you've got this collective capability. So, you know, if, if I took two or three hours out and explain the historical path from getting this commitment on through going to school and starting to teach and think I'll stay there, but then pretty soon was explained to me how promotion is done in universities by peer review, et cetera. And then if I kept talking about this kind of computer usage, I'd be an acting assistant professor forever, uh, barely that or something. So, oh, that. I realized that was true, so I left the university and started looking. So one of the places I went was Hewlett Packard, which this is pr very much pre-Silicon Valley, but I'd known about Hewlett Packard because their equipment was sort of things we learned to use as a Navy technician. See? So I went there and, oh, because my PhD research had done interesting things with 10, 12 patents, they, oh, offered me a job. And that's great. And uh, I got to meet Hewlett and Packard and was very impressed and was driving home to Berkeley and all excited. And then I stopped, oops, I stopped someplace up the line here and called up the research head to say, oh, Barney, <laughs> it's exciting to think of coming to work with you guys, uh, but I'm committed to work with computers very much in the future. So I'm assuming you guys are going to get involved in computers pretty soon. Oh, sorry, Doug, not a chance. <laughs> So there's, there's a big issue we come into here called paradigms. And uh, 
he realized what it's like. So I ended up with a, <laughs> Stanford says, well, sorry, uh, computers are going to be, a, it's just a service activity. We don't contemplate ever having courses <laughs> in it, <laughs> in the design. So I took a job at S Stanford Research Institute, that's now SRI, just quietly came in and got a job and took years to get going, which in itself is a very interesting study about that. But this capabilities thing is very key in all this thinking. So this important things to observe about our capabilities. Consider how they are derived the, and how they form an infrastructure that opens up an important perspective to our their quest for what we're going to pursue. So why, why an infrastructure? So our quest for significantly boosting our collective IQ, so that's the capability we want to boost. So, so he says, all right, this is something that emerged for me in the early 60s, that our capabilities really is an infrastructure, and your capability to, to do your primary professional goal is dependent upon a whole assortment of other capabilities, which in turn are dependent upon lower ones, etc. And uh, I guess you can see this cursor. So you pick a capability in there, you say, aha, that's something really good. And uh, if you improve that significantly, the, uh, well, the capability that depends upon it quite a bit finds that you have this new component capability that's significantly better. Well, it'll change the way it works, which changes its dependence upon its subordinate capabilities and reflects and changes on up the line. So there's this effect up and down that infrastructure of making significant changes at any point in it. And so this realize this thing that it's no simple matter. So uh, by the early, late 60s, early 70s, the term of office automation came out and this automation idea, and I said, hey, wait a minute. <laughs> you know, really what's happening is we're augmenting people and here's the structure for that. The automation said, I'm bringing in these tools. Boy, it's going to automate. And I said, well, wait a minute. For everything important you bring in that, you're going to be changing what I call the human system. And the paradigms, where the organization structure, the procedures you follow, the customs, the methods, the language, and on and on and on. And I didn't find any other name for it. Uh, I just invented the whole human system. And so the two of them are what really comprise your capability infrastructure. So if you say you get really dominant about, I'm a technologist, boy, I'm going to cure the world and come in, you realize that you're coming in, and all these other things change. And then you start thinking about that and you realize that back through all of the generations and generations and generations, a steady flow of artifacts appeared that changed things. But as they changed, the human system changed immensely. You know, agricultural tools, technology came in, hunter-gatherers could settle down, my gosh. Then they started wanting to stay on the land, et cetera, et cetera. So you got some rules about that. And uh, then they started saying, I can grow more of this than something else can, so uh, I'll start trading. So the whole business about trading go, well, commerce went. Well, commerce means you need some kind of money or something like that to flow. Well, also, then you need some kind of sort of social structure about laws. All right, you need some trading, so towns would grow, et cetera. So the whole, the whole thing about civilization just begin to evolve out of that. And you go back and look at many other. So I think about, well, how about the stupid invention of an elevator? That's going to automate your stair climbing. Oh, yeah? Well, yeah. See, now maybe six stories was about as much as people could tolerate when they walked it, but suddenly you could get much higher buildings. Oh, so the whole thing about architectural structure and engineering changed. Oh, heating and ventilating had to change greatly because of that. Oh, then the traffic, because so many people could come and have office buildings and such. So it just changed cities, it changed everything. So elevator caused a huge change. So we have to think about all that. So there's more to this picture that's important. That all of this rests upon the basic human capabilities, and I isolated these four and I would like to find people that can help me with some more of that sometime. But uh, all of that depends upon these basic capabilities. And oh yes, you have to develop the skills and the knowledge and the training of that. And then you say, okay, I sort of have a system here that these four boxes sort of what augment humans. And that's, that's where we are. So we are 
living within an augmentation system all the time and we grow up in it and take it for granted. And so then we come about with, hey, we can bring all this computer technology and it's going to change everything. It sure as hell is going to change a lot, see? And uh, so he says, okay, now we want to talk about interface and that's, that's what uh, the, in this segment, this, we're talking about the interface issue. And I said, okay, what interface? Oh, computer human interface? No, no, wait. The interface is between the basic human capabilities and this whole augmentation system. And if you really begin to realize the amount of learning and skills that you've absorbed by the time you're as partway grown up as you are, because you're all so young, you know, that um, the, uh, it's just immense. And then to find in the 70s, something like that, this mandate that the computer tools had to be easy to learn. You just say, oh, why? Well, if you're thinking of it's going to automate the secretary, well, okay. But what I was trying to tell the world, look, every knowledge worker in the future is going to be working very differently, and the whole problems are going to change. And you just, you, you got to assume that you've got a lot of learning. So in my mind, that that one kind of paradigm has done a, a great deal to cripple the potential for really going after what can we do to really get capable. So if capability is your target, you says, how can I build the capability? You don't set some artificial cost level like this in the world to do that right. See? And also, one of the things is the business world taking up on this. It turns out their paradigm, you know, yes, it, makes, it made a lot of difference in how we get the standard of living we get, et cetera. But if the business have to do business by selling their products and software products, and it has to be easy to learn, and I'm going to market it and push for all the marketing thing, that again is inhibiting very much the exploratory evolution of how you get real capability. Because down here in real capability, it's we're going to start finding different ways to use these basic human capabilities and say, oh, no, that's nothing. You're not. Oh, well, just go back and think of the um, alphabet coming along and writing. And if you realize that uh, people have very good perceptual machine, you know, they look around and they see the forest or the trees or all this thing like this, and they don't have to look at all the details of everything. Boom, that's a tree. Boom, that's this. So this perceptual machinery is in there to convert what your sensory apparatus picks up as basic sensory things and converts it into conceptual perception, stuff like this. He says, oh, boy, that's magic. Okay, so how does that affect your alphabet things? Well, you got words. There's vowels and consonants coming, coming out as represented by these characters. And you don't look at it and say, g uh, uh, d, m, d, uh, a, m, a. You don't do that. Your perceptual machinery just converts it. Good day. Boom. And it's just like you look around the room and boom, you just recognize everything with the barest glance. So if somebody who had grown up in a cave <laughs> and never had any social life was brought into your world, and the things that you take for granted would just be very, very hard for that person to adapt to and learn. And so you think of the flow of these audio sounds coming from me, and they don't, you don't decipher them in anything near a conscious term. It's a flow of concepts, etc., sort of like this. So he says, oh boy, there's that. So, hey, one of the basic, basic things that the computer can provide for you very, very different ways it can give you sensory stimuli to represent knowledge. Oh, well, why don't we start using that? Oh, no, because the way in which knowledge is portrayed is a page of a book and the writing of that. Well, why is that? Well, that's just, see, that's just the way it is. So there are paradigms get anchored to that rather than saying, hey, the computer can give us very, very different you know, symbologies, et cetera, like this. So, but you still today, the deal is you're emulating a printed page as you scan through the documents itself. So, in the 60s, when I got, finally got a chance to get some support money and started doing things, I was saying, hey, look, <clears throat> uh, you, you look at a document, why don't you have different views a computer could do? First one we tried was saying, oh, 
let's just go like this and bingo, you just see the first line of every paragraph. And it was surprising the payoff that that had right away. And uh, oh, then I want to jump to that one, it opened up. So just, well then the jumping was much more flexible. And uh, we didn't have the kind of technology in those days that you could just do this scanning, scrolling so well, so we just jump. Well then you say, let's have better addressing. Let's have so that every object is addressable. So I can make a link that points to any object in another document or this document, not just to the document. So we were doing that by the mid-60s. Just a matter of course. <clears throat> then there are many other things. You says, well, while I've got this high-level addressing, which includes things like indirect addressing, somebody else has a link sitting there, or you do, and I, my address to my link says, go to that point and take that link. <clears throat> And then you had even more. When you get there, go to the fourth next paragraph. And then from there, start looking for something with the content X. That's, that's what an address or a link could actually do. And when you get there, here's the view you want to have. <clears throat> and with all that addressability, then the ability to, to do commands. I want to move that object from there to there. There are many ways you then could flexibly point it out and tell it where to move. And then you begin to realize we have all these different objects. We don't want to be limited just to scroll text and cut and paste that. We can say, I want to deal with a word or a phrase or a paragraph or a whole, whole branch in a hierarchical organization or something. So anyway, so all that grew and grew. Um, and then the vocabulary got to be such that, well, it got pretty hard for beginners to come in and learn. So we fixed it so when you boot it up, you had whatever limited or more and more advanced vocabulary stuff offered to you. And, uh, oh, people could learn very, very quickly on limited vocabulary. And it was surprising then once <coughs> they go around and watch other people, hey, what did you just do? Oh, I just transposed those things. What the hell is transpose? Well, it's a verb that means you interchange two objects. Jeez, I want that. <laughs> well, hey, what is the different noun you just used? Oh, it's something we call a group. What's a group? Well, it's a consecutive set of similar level um, nodes. <clears throat> oh, I see. Oh, that's good. I want to have that object in there like this. So the vocabulary for both the verbs and nouns and qualifiers just would grow. And uh, when people came in, it was easy to learn and easy to grow. <clears throat> but the other people watching it from the outside world, they'd watch us operate, so everybody wanted to show them the best thing to do. and. Uh, so the reputation was that ours was extremely hard to learn, etc. And uh, the artificial intelligence people on one end and the office automation on the other happened to be sort of populating pretty well the peer reviews and proposals, etc. So by 1977, when we were supporting people all over the network, etc., uh, with real work, uh, the, we just suddenly found ourselves turned down and run out. So a very important lesson about the business of paradigms, right at the top of that human system thing. That the paradigms that are there and are operator are things that are going to have extremely significant effect upon how your future is viewed and how the different pathways into that future could be considered as practical and how to get in gear and go about it. So that's one of the greatest, biggest things. So how do you set about evolving paradigms? Things like this. So. That's a social phenomenon that's very hard to, to get. And it's sort of like saying, okay, that affects extremely heavily how a society sort of adapts to what its picture of the future is. So the paradigms are evolving much more slowly than are all of the changes that are being accelerated, the other changes. So if we're farther and farther behind with our paradigms about what the options are in the future, and what's reasonable to consider to go after it, et cetera, we're sort of doomed. And I got this picture of this clumsy vehicle that's not being steered very well, can't see very far, going faster and faster, and not much problems. So there are a few other ideas in here, and uh, I can't see a clock from here. Oh, I started a little late. Uh, how do I decide when to quit? <laughs> oh. oh, well, <laughs> thank you.
Anyway, here's a business scale. Here's the different scales of activity. Individuals, communities, complete world, complete country, a world. Okay, here's what you're trying to do with one person, operative IQ, collective IQ. Okay, oh, so we claim that this, this augmentation model is valid over that big scale. So if that's the case, then we have a lot of things to think about that, that, you know, I don't get much dialogue about that model, which I really would, would like to do. It's been there for decades, and it's just ruled me completely. But so this kind of collective IQ, so the purposely pursuing accelerated evolution of our knowledge development and application capabilities it's a huge challenge and requires very effective strategies in applying them. So here comes the question of scale. And um, when I was working at what's now NASA, I was actually an electrical engineer taking care of keeping the wind tunnels running. <laughs> so the aeronautical scientists with their experiments in there were always very nice to me because hey, keep it running, keep it running, because they'd have to sign up for the use of that wind tunnel for a few days to run their experiment. And if the wind tunnel was down or something, they were out of luck, see? So well, if I was curious about questions like, hey, you're sending this funny little model here in your wind tunnel, and that's supposed to teach you what's going to happen when it's the size of a whole airplane? Oh, yeah. Well, how in the world do you do that? Well, there's a whole science about scaling and dimensional scaling. And there are things called dimensionless numbers. <laughs> There's a real configuration of the different parameters that are involved in it so that it's, all the dimensions cancel out. And if that number stays constant, then the data you've gotten on this thing will hold uh, in the way you interpret it for larger size. Oh, that's really fascinating. Well, in my first years at SRI, what I was learning that I just really have to be careful and not be trying to talk about all this wild future. Um, I happened to be talking to an Air Force, a guy running part of an Air Force research lab, and I was talking to him about scaling. And I said, you know, electronic components are going to have the same thing in it, the scaling effect, that things change when you get size. And, uh, oh, so he, I, he gave me a grant to make a study on scaling. And uh, it was very important to me to learn about that. So it's like saying, if I um, want to talk to you guys about scaling, and I said, okay, suppose by some magic, uh, this room and everybody in it and everything you could see suddenly got 10 times bigger in every dimension. Would you notice? See? And you know, I, I asked that at a conference in 1958, I think, or something. <laughs> And it was the same kind of puzzled response, see. So anybody analytic would look over and say, well, that person could be 10 times taller, but they're 10 times farther away, and they'd subtend the same angle, and I, you know, geez, I wouldn't notice any difference, would I? Uh, okay, well, how much more do you weigh? Oh, well, let's see, 10 times 10 times 10, hmm, 1,000 times as much? Yeah, I'd weigh 1,000 times as much, wow. Well, how much stronger would you be? Jeez, 10,000 times stronger? No, no. Your strength is proportional to cross-section area of your bones and muscles. So you'd be 100 times stronger. And suddenly you realize it's the same thing as if you were one-tenth your strength now at your current weight. See, you probably wouldn't be able to stand up or even sit up. Well, and so you'd be on the floor, and your bones and such would probably break, and uh, nobody could come and help you. <laughs> and he says, oh, geez, so everybody reflected. So. Scaling really different, different phenomena are affected by the volume or the area or the length, etc. And uh, some of them just by one more than the others. So as you shift the scale, the phenomena shift the way they work. And you take a device like even a mousetrap that would work at one scale and you try to just build a scale model of a tenth or a hundredth that size and it just wouldn't work at all like you want to. And, uh, so the thing is, from that you realize that current devices at the time to build binary things uh, depend upon phenomenal relationships. And so you had to get smaller and smaller, you'd find different phenomena who could, that could be connected together with a relationship such that you could make a device out of it. 
oh boy, so a smaller, smaller size be, and the speed of everything will go up too that way. And he says, okay, that's pretty good. That just says, okay, I could tell that the world's going to have all of the computing power and memory that, that uh, you'll ever want, you could consider today to have useful. So let's get busy figuring out what we do about it. So that's been driving me since the late 50s, like that time like that. So it's still there, and it's, nanotechnology is coming in about with it. And so the other side of the thing is the scale of our problems and the scale of the challenge and trying to deal with them is getting more and more complex, and we're not very good at dealing with large-scale social, political, economic problems like this. The problems in the world, it's... Uh, Hey, I brought with me uh, something to to show you about world problems. That uh, there's a publication put out every year called the State of the Future, 2001, 2002. It's by an organization. It's been underfunded, but really valiantly conducted in Washington under the United Nations University called the Millennium Project. And over the years, with interacting with people all over the world, serious people thinking about it, they've isolated 15 major challenges to humanity. And these things, and finding ways to measure, getting indexes on them, etc. And uh, I wish I had, it's, it's in my briefcase, wherever it is. <laughs> but afterwards I can show you. But it really, um, really gives you a picture for that. And these are all things, it's like fresh water. Oh. We're just, the world is not have, we're running out of it in ways that's being used and being blocked, et cetera, like this. The, uh, uh, the organized crime is getting to be something that is such a big factor now. They've been listing corruption in government most all these years as something that really is there. And the government at every stage is saying, you know, it's getting more and more complex. The, pub, the people don't realize enough and understand it enough in order to be able to counter, you know, uh, corrupt ways in describing or guiding them or something like this. So, on and on. Uh, that, so anyway, it's just, the world's full of them, but even the businesses that are running, the problems of how to run a good business. So, there's a lot further here that I'm not getting into. Uh, uh, about saying these dynamic knowledge repositories, how they have to be concurrent, that the one your company would run you just can't afford to be that much different from the one somebody else is running because you still have to communicate and prove things. And uh, the whole idea of structured, lot, lot, diagrammed argumentation and uh, where the business of links that'll point to any object means I can build a diagram which every node is connected by a link pointing out to the particular passage, no matter where. And then the scheme we've got for, hey, uh, we'd be able to go and dynamically transform any given document of any kind or database into a standard sort of XML kind of thing that has the structural, the meta metadata kind of characteristics in it that let us go through it so quickly and move and and observe and and use it to structure these argumentations for, for us. So there are really, really explicit things we can do. So one of the biggest things is to kind of get the paradigms adapted so people says, oh yeah, and it doesn't offer a particular business opportunity right now or something, but it's extremely critical that almost in every major thing we're thinking about, including education or something, we really learn how to be a lot more effective collectively. And I'm sorry I didn't get to all the fun details down into side this. I got Gabby. Um, so I, I really appreciate the chance and this whole thing about accelerated change just plays right into this because uh, our, our opportunities are going up and our paradigms need to start shifting and it's going to make the world more and more complex. So, peace. Say goodbye.
Yes? Okay. <laughs> let, let, let's open it up for a bit of Q&A. Uh, well, thank you very much. Doug, you, you talked about effective strategies for dealing with complexity, and, and I want to ask you what those are, but that would probably take us the rest of the afternoon. Uh, maybe a better question is, where would we go to find them? Um, in all the part I didn't get to it here, it's saying, uh, hey, it's so complex, there's nobody's got the answer. And every answer you could think of would be great, you plug it in, and it's going to start changing the rest of that whole augmentation collective environment. So the best thing you can do is to try to facilitate the evolution. And it's the co-evolution of all the elements in that capability infrastructure augmentation system. So the co-evolution got to be a dominant thing. And uh, nobody's, nobody's smart enough to understand the, the best configuration of all of those elements in your augmentation system to really get the effect you want. So he says, okay, that uh, uh, the best way to do is find an effective way to facilitate the evolution. And so out of that comes ideas about saying, oh, hey, the earlier we started getting a paid attention to this dynamic knowledge repository, we could start using that to help us get the best picture we could of how to build better dynamic knowledge repositories and how, what kind of models of them are being built and used in the past, et cetera. Oh, so the better you got at uh, doing that particular project, the better you're going to get at getting better at that. And so that's where I came up with the term bootstrapping decades ago, is saying, oh, you know, that, that's, that's an important thing to focus on, the kind of capabilities to pursue that would improve the capabilities to pursue. <laughs> and um, so then that has ways of, of turning into a strategy that it says if I've got this big a scale of challenge to do, there isn't any way it's going to be a one deal thing. So he says, okay, we want to set up this infrastructure that can facilitate the, the evolution. And uh, the core part of that is, is improvement communities that are focused on improving certain capabilities in the world, capability to cope with with uh, diseases, capability of coping with uh, global warming, et cetera. Well, okay, many of those are going to be very important approaches, so it'd be too bad if they all each approached it in a different sort of fundamental way. So how you can get uh, central, central activities going that they're all participating in helping evolve ever better ways to build and use these dynamic knowledge repositories. And that would even include how do you get better at educating people to use it, or educating schools, or you know the whole the whole social, political, business, etc. World has to start evolving, and to do it in some way in which they've got enlightened perspectives, as much understanding as possible, would seem like humanity deserves it. And uh, for each of the elements, it's got its own push. You know, the research community's got it, the military support's got it, National Science Foundation and its peer reviewers have got theirs. Business has a very strong one that they can argue about, and uh, et cetera. But, but they're oriented in only one segment of our society's supportive evolution. So they have to start getting involved in the whole bigger picture. Geez, if every question, I guess... <laughs> If I take half an hour to answer it, is that? <laughs> um, you, you described your insights into, uh, let's say, computer user interfaces that people at the time could not comprehend. And I'm wondering, uh, is there anything you'd like to describe that you can see now that this audience 
even though it's a future story oriented audience, is not yet able to comprehend. Gee, I don't want to insult them to their face. <laughs> uh, well, how about, the, how about the very edge of it, what I'm not sure I understand, would that solve the <laughs> uh, Well, I, I have what I call a, an open hyper-document system that I named, gave that name to 20 years ago as saying we have to find a coherent standard way for bundling up our knowledge into knowledge containers that have the properties that let us best sort of do the kind of studying, developing, integrating, assessing, et cetera, et cetera, that we need to do. And uh, so that's something that has to, I call it an open hyper document system, and that was some years before I learned about open source, which then I immediately says, yes, it has to be open source. Because the very terms about the, the objects that are in there, the knowledge objects, and the means of portraying them and manipulating them, etc., is got to be open, just like our natural language had to be open evolution. And even though there's specialty fields like algebra or chemistry or something of that in which the vocabulary based upon the natural language, general natural language, would have its special terms and, and et cetera, that people move into their new that they, oh yes, I don't know what you mean by this or that equipment, but I'll learn it pretty quickly. <laughs> the concepts that, oh, people don't have to look at something in order to ch do something with it. It's like, you don't have any trouble telling your six-year-old or something, hey, run upstairs to the bathroom and there's a second drawer to the right, this, this side of the sink, you'll find my hairbrush, would you bring it to me? Instead of having to go up there and point to some moron who's limited to pidgin English, you know, it says, no, we, we do that. So we, that same kind of flexibility in our dealing with our, our logic form, you know, our, our objects in our language and the way we portray them, et cetera, we've got to be free to evolve and we have to get over some of those unfortunate paradigms which have limited that. And uh, I just feel like um, people are, you know, that we need to have in that open hyper document system, what we ought to provide for is different user interfaces could plug in. So, okay, you're, you're a pedestrian in this world. You, you, here you can have your simple one, but the same kind of objects that are in there, that are in there, that somebody that's expert can go and has an interface that may have very, very different physical interfaces to them that takes a long time to learn how to operate. But the skill level is great. So um, when I was early trying to object to people saying the easy to learn stuff and they says, you just don't understand the world. That's just the way it is. And I said, oh, that's why everybody's still riding tricycles, huh? See, bicycle is quite difficult to learn, and that difficulty stems from the fact that almost nobody I found out understands how you ride a bicycle, what you're really doing. I, when we lived out in the country as I was a kid, a real country kid that I'd never outgrown, anyway, bicycles were the way we lived, and my brother and I learned how to ride them backwards, stand up on them, and all kinds of things. And uh, one of our favorite things was some smart aleck younger kid yeah, yeah, that's when we were playing those tips. We would just reach our hand across to the left hand part of the handlebars and say, here, try this. It's absolutely guaranteed. Don't do it unless you're in a safe place because it's guaranteed to crash you. Because you've learned without knowing it that what you do when you ride a bicycle is steer it. You steer it to keep the wheels under you, to keep the balance. See, like that. So you're, you don't know about, so all your reflexes like that are, would be reversed over here. Just like if you're trying to ride backwards, which is how we learned to reverse like that. So my brother and I could do it. And uh, everybody else just crashes, so. <laughs> Depends on what you think about them. Hey, kid, try this. Or hey, dear, try this. Sometimes you're angry at your wife. Huh? <laughs> 
Oh, no, no, that was the wife saying, hey, dear, try this. I guess. <laughs> anyway, there, there are a lot of things that we don't appreciate about this kind of skill levels. And one of them is I'm just so much interested in is, is the kind of capabilities these perceptual machinery has in our, in our brain. And uh, like one thing I really, really want to try, and I've never had the resources, and part of it is I didn't understand grammar well enough, that um, I like to get a parsing processor going that parses your sentences. And then it gives you the option of having the different parts of speech in different color or different brightness. And I'm, I'm just intuitively certain that if you started reading that way, that this machinery would start adapting to it, and pretty soon you'd be reading faster with more comprehension than if you have monocolor, mono size, et cetera, things as they are now. That's the kind of thing that the computer aids can really, really help you. And um, so tell me if anybody can try it. Let me try it. <laughs> uh, I think I've overdone the time. Well, thank you. Thank you so much, Doug. It was really enlightening. Now, uh, before we head out for a break, Mark just wants to make one quick uh, announcement. Yeah, because I, I knew that the time that we allocated for him wasn't enough. Um, I invited him to do a future salon, which is Friday in a week at SAP, 6 o'clock uh, till 9 o'clock. So we have at least two hours. And uh, please come, and there he will. Um, be available again for more questions and um, please um, thank you very much Doug that you came out. <laughs>